do Szechuan. Uh, I think we met more than one year ago. Um, and we started meeting regularly via Zoom uh, once a week. And you were preparing your doctoral application. And one day you said, uh, I, I will be studying, I'll be moving to Northern Ireland and I have a, a supervisor. Is this incredible guy that has an unbelievable collection of flutes uh, and you have to meet him. And his name uh, was Simon Waters and I, now because of you I have the, the privilege and opportunity to meet him. Simon, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much to Christina Ilman and, and Gonzalo from the Folk Music Department of the Sibelius Academy for inviting me here. Um, in every conference there's a sort of boring, more academic paper, um, so if, if that isn't your taste, now is the time to shut your ears. Um, I know nothing at all about bagpipes, so I have, uh, I have no authority to be here at all. Um, my intention here is to reinvigorate musical instrument studies with a dose of thought from other disciplines, sociology, anthropology, interaction design, some philosophy light, with a view to dispensing with its antiquarian organological roots and situating it more centrally, as John Blacking would have wished, as a key part of our understanding of human activity in general, even symptomatic of our human activity. What's important to acknowledge right away is that nothing I'm going to say is new. Even within organology, there's a long and growing thread of what I'd call dissident thought, which challenges the terms of reference that organology has chosen for itself. Here are a list of some of them. The first cluster are from a conference in Edinburgh, which has since, m most have since been widely published. The bottom two are, th I think, are crucial. Um, Elliot Bates on the social life of musical instruments, and a lot of Kevin Dawes' work, and an ethnomusicologist who I guess you'll be familiar with. My presentation will fall into roughly four sections, which deal with the object status of musical instruments, the nature of expertise, digital tools, and what I'll call the mu museum's use of instruments. I'd like to insert another word, but I won't. Um, musical instruments are crucial indices of human activity, narratives of use and value, which can frequently only be appreciated through being actively engaged with. Without such intimate engagement, knowledge is palpably lost. Instruments encode and teach us about ideologies and value systems. They function as devices with which we can negotiate our commonality and our difference and allow us to time travel in a number of ways, through memory and histories, and even to temporarily escape our awareness of time passing. So it seems that it might not be sufficient to think of musical instruments as objects, and that ontologies which encourage us to do so are not really helpful. Let's start at the material level, where it seems, it seems self-evident that musical instruments are objects. The view faces a number of obstacles. Musical instruments are, in fact, dynamic systems. Not static, conservable objects, but processes in a constant state of change, seasoning, adjustment and decay. This dynamic quality is sensed by players who engage in active dialogue with and constant monitoring of the state of their, their instruments. Musical instruments are assemblages an accumulation of parts in, a dynamic, in dynamic relationships with each other and with the player. Indeed, calibration, the musical adaptation between player and instrument, which Barnaby demonstrated, um, which may involve multiple dialogues between instrument, maker, other musicians, where the raw instrument is gradually adapted to the player's imagining, is where the material object is fashioned into becomes a musical instrument. As soon as one places the instrument into a real context of use, the question emerges of where one inserts the insecure boundary between a player and an object. 
there's general recognition that the instrument transduces the conduct of a particular player in a particular manner. That a good instrument does this differently in the case of each player. Much about musical value and judgment is bound up with the specifics of each individual's relationship with an instrument. This enables us to know and to recognise the touch or style of a particular guitarist or trumpeter, Pat Metheny or Miles Davis, for example, independently of the particular instrument that they are using. The instrument must also adapt or be adapted to a particular context of use, environmentally. Obvious examples include different sizes and acoustics in public spaces. Uh, as you'll see on the left, someone playing the sax in a subway. And less obviously, Beethoven, Beethoven's adaptation of his piano on the right to compensate for deafness. This leads us to the realisation that the distinction between instrument and environment is as difficult to determine as that between instrument and player. In context to where microphones, amplifiers and loudspeakers are introduced, the assemblage of the musical instrument becomes indistinguishable from the assemblage of the environment. My old German double bass is set up with low tension strings and low action, with an increased neck angle to give an even response and a long sustain when plucked. It's acoustically relatively quiet, but this doesn't matter as I rarely play it without amplification. This affords a combination of intimacy and clarity which couldn't be achieved by making the instrument acoustically louder. It also allows someone who doesn't practice sufficiently to play without pain. And any electric guitarist will tell you that changing a single valve in an amplifier can entirely alter the response of the instrument as a whole, the instrument conceived as a system. The biggest challenge to the instrument as object paradigm comes from digital technology. At, digital, at conferences and festivals around the world, communities which dwarf the self-identifying organology community discuss whether something is a musical instrument, what is the nature of an interface, how to harness gesture to control sound production, and where the gesture is even an appropriate metaphor for what humans do when they play music. Their discourse is sophisticated because it is hybrid, taking in concepts from artificial intelligence and cognitive sciences, sociology and ethnomethodology, philosophy and linguistics, STS, science and technology studies, to name but a few. At these conferences, NIME, ICMC, ICLE, SMC, CHI, assemblages of physical devices and computer code are configured and reconfigured in the service of music making. Organology ignores this at its peril, partly because the total community of those involved in the conferences just mentioned is ten times that involved in the une uneasy community of organology, but more profoundly because su such technologies are complicit in the making of nearly all music now. Of course, as we know from historical study, technological change does not imply anything as positivistic as progress, but it does change what human beings do and what they perceive as possible or desirable. When I started as a composer making music with tape recorders in the 1970s, electroacoustic music, as it was called, from the French musique électroacoustique, was a pe peculiarity on the fringes of, an, of the already recherché world of contemporary music. But by 2019, my students, for most of whom the primary vehicle of mo music production and performance is the laptop, retrospectively, and probably wrongly, regard my involvement in such activity as pioneering and prophetic. Clearly then, a musical instrument is defined as such, as musical, in its use within a community of practice. One might almost say that it's a set of relationships rather than an object. For this reason, I've argued that musical instruments function in a performance ecosystem, in which the distinctions between player, instrument and environment are not self-evident. That these apparently distinct categories are in fact always involved in multi-directional feedback loops, in which it becomes misleading to study one component in isolation. Current instrument building practices, in which makers and players avail themselves of hybrids of physical materials and computation systems, physical models in computers, and the interactions between these, 
offer up a significant challenge to organology's position as the study of material objects. I'm just going to scoot over some stuff here because I put in, stupidly, an example of my own work which isn't really important. Um, paradoxically, given organology's dependence on material objects, it often proceeds through abstractions which effectively ignore contexts of use, those specific situations which make up musical activity. For this reason, it tends to set aside the perhaps poetic-seeming notion that instruments are conduits for the imagination. This is something both players and composers know well. Musical instruments are also prosth prosthetic sensors through which human beings can explore their world and test out the essential qualities of empathy, touching each other at a distance, so to speak. Organology's adoption of an ideology of conformity, of normal playing behaviour, underpins its separation of musical instruments from other objects, despite the palpable evidence that in the hands of a musician, anything might be imbued with musical qualities. This drives current taxonomies of musical instruments, abstractions which have an obvious effect on the manner in which scholarship proceeds, and becomes as a result parceled up into rather hermetic territories, the silos to which Barnaby also referred. One class of instrument to the detriment, studying and focusing on one class of instrument, for example, to the detriment of our understanding of the commonalities which underpin, for example, the complex relationship between artisanship and manufacturing. Bagpipe geeks, beware. I said earlier that it was misleading to study the components of a human activity in isolation, and perhaps you'll forgive me if I draw on another example from my background in interaction design to indicate what I mean. Any anthropologist or sociologist will tell you that there's a key difference between human plans, abstract codifications of intent, often reduced to a series of logical steps, and situated actions, how they behave in reality, which can be much more rich and complex. Lucy Suchman's detailed analysis of the behaviour of two intelligent humans misunderstanding a photocopier designed by human computer interface experts takes up a significant proportion of her influential book. This is Human Machine Reconfigurations, subtitled Plans and Situated Actions. And I recommend it very strongly as a corrective to any thinking which attempts to account for human activity as reducible to logical or functional abstracted steps. It forms a wonderful example of the rich density of actual, situated, improvised and contingent, that word again, human behaviour, of what happens when plans are transmuted into the complexities of real activity. In metaphorical terms, in the terms of Lucy Suchman, organology often gets dangerously near to describing the potential workings and designed logic of the photocopier without considering the ingenuity and potential variability of its use in real situations. The assumptions of a reductive expert position, such as that occupied by the photocopier software designer, or the organologist, depending on which argument you're following, can fundamentally misrepresent the practice of human activity, of actual human activity. Much the same caution is needed when recreating an activity from codified knowledge in the form of, for example, instrumental methods. Just imagine if we want to attempt to recreate the complex practice-based activity that is jazz solely from the abstracted written representations of how to do it. The result would be unlikely to resemble anything remotely like jazz, and yet we're quite happy to do that with Ganassi. Why? Um, David Sudno uh, reflects on the difficulties of embodying jazz in his wonderful autoethnographic text on attempting to transition from classical playing to jazz piano playing. He describes in detail the business of the difference between knowing jazz and doing jazz, being able to in, allow his body to inhabit playing jazz. He could play all the chords and the notes, but what he played was still essentially Mozart, not jazz. And he had to learn how to be jazz inside the playing of the piano, a difficult thing for a classically trained pianist. And it's an interesting piece of anthropological study. Ultimately, what's in contention here is what constitutes knowledge, and in particular, expertise. Institutions and disciplines would do well to engage with what Philip Agray termed 
critical technical practice. As a practitioner of artificial intelligence in California in the late 1990s, Agro realized that much of what held back his discipline was that a small, stable community of people worked with a relatively fixed set of language and methodologies and treated their own abstractions as realities. Agro's argument, which I hear hijack from musical instrument studies, was that the key to a genuinely critical scholarship was to find a manner of bringing peripheral ideas and language to the center of thought, to fundamentally change the nature of what was regarded as expertise, allowing more dissident thought to transform the, net, transform the network of knowledge. As an experiment, I decided to put this to the test in musical instrument studies, attempting to build my own study in which all of the networks of knowledge around the making of an instrument, acoustic, sociological, historical, sensory, and imaginary, were regarded as equally significant, a sort of flat ontology. Not all valuable research is carried out within acad acad academies, and by drawing on evidence from folk musicians, practicing folk musicians, scientists, engineers, current flute makers, collectors, genealogists researching their personal family histories, and other independent researchers, often gathered through email or social media platforms, as well as from analysis of digitized public published materials, such as online newspapers, and from accounts of trials in court. I was able to synthesize a pattern of relationships between music sellers and woodwind making workshops in late 18th and 19th century London, which is truly surprising in its extensiveness. Some of the preliminary outcomes from this research were presented at a conference in Edinburgh in 2018, and more extended results have just been published in the Galpin Society Journal. One of the dissident modes of thought deployed within this study is a loose version of Latour's actor network theory. Actor network theory is a methodology for understanding interconnection, a way of interrogating knowledge as if all the agents in a network of activity, whether sentient or otherwise, are recognised as co-determining the outcomes of that activity. And this mode of study is already producing benefits to our understanding of musicking, as scholars follow the actors, however insignificant seeming, in establishing chains of connection between bodies, objects and ideas. This is a challenge to the materiality issue. Digital tools for the analysis of such complex networks of data now allow us to quantify and learn from the degrees of connectedness of individuals, objects, institutions, and ideas in such multidimensional networks. Earlier sociological approaches to the study of networks, social, such as social network analysis, drew attention, for example, to how surprisingly few clusters of individuals were involved in the emergence of the punk music in England. This is from Crossley. Or in the musical institutions of Venice in the 1670s to 1690s. This is Molly Abel's. By extending these technologies to include objects, ideas, places, and incidents, as well as people, I hope to have elaborated and reshaped our views of the London musical instrument making community in the early 19th century. Note that in addition to confirming the centrality of certain individuals, workshops, and ideas, such studies also, also disclose both the contingency and the continuous, collaborative, distributed, and communal aspects of instrument making. Again, I think that will appeal to Barnaby's qualities that he established at the beginning and end of his presentation. Such new tools also give us new methods for critical thought, casting the assumptions of some previous scholarship in doubt in my area, which is flutes, obviously, where Rockstro or Bate, for example, might have supported a particular analysis with one or two examples, the knowledge that old instruments are simply much less scarce than we thought, coupled with new ways of aggregating knowledge of these instruments, allows us to make more statistically viable guesses at survival rates and to predict the likely scale and nature of production. The early 19th century practice among some makers of numbering instruments helps this process immensely and gives us models for the rate of workshop output, for example. And it's not only statistically based information that can be built on a more secure knowledge base. Digitized resources online allow us, to access, allow us access to personal narratives, which also disclose detail about musical instruments and their use. Digital systems have transformed our knowledge of, access to, analytical tools for, and modes of presentation of information around musical instruments. 
They've also enabled us to make new copies of musical instruments and complete them thanks to the work of people like Zeshuan. Um, viewed in such a manner, questions of scarcity, authorship or maker identity, provenance, whoops, sorry, provenance, measurement and classification, which have been the stock in trade of organology's emergence from antiquarianism, can be placed in a critical perspective. It can be seen that studies based in statistical analysis and computer modeling, or conversely, in personal narratives and more transparent access to archive material, might contribute equally richly to an appreciation and understanding of musical instruments and the contexts of their use. Of course, my critique of organology is partly both parodic and provocative. There is much profound research on musical instruments going on. We've heard some of it this morning. But it isn't often well integrated with communities such as the American Musical Instrument Society or the Galpin Society, tend to, tending to produce parallel themes of often more scientific research, the rationales and philosophical bases of which throw up potential, potential challenges to conventional organology, but which don't fundamentally alter its day-to-day -day activities. It's significant, too, that increasingly little of that research chooses to attach itself to the term organology. It prefers the term musical instrument studies. The role of institutions, in this instance the Sepalius Academy, in supporting and coordinating detailed work involving networks of knowledge and methodology is crucial. But so is the invest involvement of private collectors who, who can authorise privileged, privileged levels of access to instruments. This brings us to my last topic, museums. We need to think through museum custodianship as a continuation of particular types and patterns of use, rather than, the, uh, rather than only the occasionally neglectful semi-preservation of material objects, which is what, in my opinion, they mostly involve themselves in. The performance ecosystem within which I see musical instruments as partial actors is echoed by the larger ecological perspective within which all activity takes place performers, musicians, instrument-making workshops, museums, all are situated within particular social, political and economic environments which sustain and challenge them, all of which, particularly now, are dynamic and shifting, and to which we must adapt imaginatively. It's notable, for example, that collectors are increasingly wary of leaving instruments to museums or the state for reasons which are obvious to most of us. This is a not very well developed method of representing one, two, three, four, five musical instruments in timelines which are roughly proportional to the existence of those instruments. The green bits are, are, are where the instrument is both playable and in use. The orange dotted bits, the, the red bits are where it's not in use and are in either a private or public collection. The dotted bits are where there is inadequate evidence. Um, but it's interesting to note just in this simple diagrammatic form, the percentages of time in which an instrument that was made to be a musical instrument is functioning in a musical context or not. Uh, the first thing is a, is a harpsichord, the first English harpsichord that was exported to New Zealand, a Kirkman from 1756. Uh, the next is a Nicholson flute, uh, an, an 18, late 1830s flute in my personal collection, uh, which is unusual and is there because the entirety of its history is known. It was given to me by the family who bought the, bought the flute when it was first manufactured, and I have evidence of every part of its life. Uh, the next is a, an, an equivalent flute in the Dayton Miller Collection in Washington, who have, to whom I'm very grateful. They've allowed me fantastic access to instruments, and I wouldn't include them in my criticism of museums. The next is a, is a potter flute that was remade by another manufacturer in my own collection. And then a Stainsby flute that I had access to when it was with its original owner. Sorry, not original owner. It's, its most recent owner, Nicholas McGeegan, um, which is now the, the big star means it's just gone into an ed, uh, in the museum in Edinburgh and nobody's allowed to handle it anymore. Um, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? There are, of course, competing and overlapping stories here of science, of belief, of tradition, of value. But the one with which I want to try and convince you is the story that such meaning as we invest in objects which form part of human conduct 
is understood most profoundly through understanding those objects in the multiple contexts of their use. I'll leave you uh, with a brief recap, which will, I hope, also flag points for future discussion. Thank you very much for listening. I apologise for the rather academic nature of the presentation. Um, and there's a bunch of thanks. The most important people are at the bottom there. I include Session because without him I wouldn't have met Gonzalo. Without Gonzalo I wouldn't have met Christina and so on. Networks, that's what it's all about. Thank you. That's me, that's me when I had more hair. Oh, less hair, sorry. Less hair. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we do have our five minutes for questions to Simon and then we should all go to get some lunch because there's more to talk in the afternoon. Uh, please, please remember that there was something deliberately parodic and, and, and provocative about that. You know, it's, I, know, I know who I'm speaking to here. Part of it is, the ethos of it is to generate conversations and arguments, not to close down discussion at all. And, and it very much follows from the principles which, which Barnaby elaborated in his presentation. And it should, should be taken in, the, in that spirit. Thank you, Simon. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you uh, how much there is actually conversation or discussion about uh, the issue of uh, museum objects. And I, I really, really liked your idea of uh, uh, this continuation of particular types of and patterns of use rather than physical objects. Well, being so, a museum is a use for for an, for an instrument or an object, but, but it's only a use if actual humans are given access to it, and if it's yeah. not used in that way, then being in a vault is a kind of use, but it's not a very humanly useful use. Is there a movement in the UK about this? <sighs> I think it's, it's difficult to generalise. Museums have, despite the fact that there are, there are kind of guidelines, the SimSim guidelines and, and all the other kind of agencies which, which indicate... Uh, preferred conditions for museum preservation and so on. Museums have very different practices. The, uh, just to talk about some of the ones that I mentioned in my, in my presentation, the Bate Collection in Oxford, which is primarily a collection of wind instruments, allows critically evaluated but completely unmediated access. You can handle instruments without gloves, you can play them. Um, obviously the curator there vets who's going to be doing that, but but access is thoughtful, considered, very open, uh, a, a very good model in my view. Um, uh, having looked at the instruments there a lot and compared with the, them with other museums to which I've had continuous or, or regular access, the instruments there don't degrade any faster than in any other collection. In fact, they're probably in marginally better condition than in most uh, than in most collections um, and obviously there are even within the UK the opposite extreme some of them very big and influential museums and, and they can often be the most obstructive um, I didn't mention any of those museums deliberately in this presentation but they, knew that they know who they are as for the kind of I think there was the question was you know is there something to do about this yes absolutely and I think that it would be nice to have institutional support f for the primarily individual intuition, not, not my intuition, but the intuition of multiple individuals, that the ways in which expertise is established and allowed to, to run the conservation and curation of musical objects in museums isn't necessarily either very expert or very helpful. Um, so I've had some remarkable exchanges with people who have, you know, have curatorship and supposedly conservation knowledge who've worried about my touching cleaning silver because they think that silver is going to disappear at a phenomenal rate. They know nothing about metallurgy or material science at all. So, um, and I've, I've been told that, that, that silver will corrode, you know. Um, uh, yeah, some some very very strange challenges to to wanting to do very very simple things that are actually informed by a knowledge of handling instruments. 
What I think institutions could do is support those groups of individuals in perhaps coming up with, rather than belly aching about it, perhaps coming up with a series of proposals which are deliverable and would enable access to people in a more informed and still safe manner. Uh, I think some groups of museums are trying to do that, but I think unless it's informed by people from outside the debate, that's a Philip, Philip Agray thing I talked about, artificial intelligence, I think it's very unlikely that that, debate, that, that will end where we would like it to be. I mean, it's simply not, not dangerous for human beings to handle a woodwind instrument without gloves. In fact, it's much more dangerous to handle them with gloves. I've, I've only seen museum curators damage instruments, never people who have experience in handling them. Simon, uh, the afternoon session will be in a different hall, Camerata, and uh, um, we now have to move the technical apparatus from this hall to the next hall, and we also have to have some lunch. And we have uh, our uh, roundtable guest, uh, Aki Arponen, waiting for us. So we should, we should go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the guests and especially to the wonderful people that came to, to watch and listen to these presentations and also the people that are at home and everyone that made this possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.